Professor Sumita Roy, ma'am, shall we begin? Meanwhile, the participants will join, probably. Sure. Yes, thank you. To be inspired is great. To be an inspiration is an honor. A warm and cherished afternoon to our resource person for the day, Professor Sumita Roy, our corresponding Sister Shamla, our dear principal, Sister Amy Grezi Vaz, Sisters of Management, Chief Coordinator and Head, Department of Business Management, Professor Y. Sucharita, my dear participants across the nation, my learned colleagues. On behalf of St. Anne's Degree and PG College for Women, Malapur, Hyderabad, I, Mrs. M. Saujanya, an Associate Professor and Head Department of BBA, extend a warm welcome to you all for the last day session of national level online faculty enhancement program on new age learning and teaching skills. A good teacher teaches, a great teacher inspires. We have one such inspirational teacher amongst us today to throw a light on how to teach, especially Gen Z students who were born between 1997 and 2012. She is none other than Professor Sumida Roy. I deem it as an honor and privilege to introduce our resource person, Professor Sumida Roy, to deliver a session on teaching Zen Z for the last day session of national level online FEP. Qualified with MA, MPhil, PhD, Ma'am was retired in 2017 as head, Department of English and Director, English Language Training Center, Usmania University, Hyderabad. Ma'am has a rich teaching experience of 40 years, 31 years of pursuing research, 24 years of research supervision. Happy to inform you all that Ma'am has guided 15 PhDs and 12 MPhil scholars under her guidance. For postdoctoral research, uh, uh, post doctoral research Ma'am is principal investigator for three research projects sponsored by UGC, one MHRD, and one AICT MOOCs projects. Ma'am has visited 15 countries on academic and other assignments. Some of her international experiences are, Ma'am was invited to conduct workshop on research methodology at Daffodil International University, Dhaka, Bangladesh. She has been invited to speak at Munster University, Germany on Indian diasporic literature. She has been invited to speak at Vedanta Center of St. Louis, USA on practical Vedanta in June 2015. As director, Usmania University Center for International Programs, MAM executed MOUs with Missouri State University, USA, Fraser Valley University, Canada, Zovic University, Norway, Dusseldorf University, Germany. In 2006, MAM was conferred with Books on Books Award by the Federation of Indian Publishers, New Delhi, for publication entitled Never Say No to Life. The various positions held by MAM are Head, Department of English, Usmania University, Director, English Language Training Center, Usmania University, Director, OU Canadian Studies Center, Chairperson, Board of Studies, Department of English, Usmania University, Academic Coordinator, Nizam Colleges, to name a few. The academic engagements of MAM, she was Principal Investigator for Swayam MOOC course of MHRD entitled Modern British Literature in the year 2016-17. She has rendered YouTube videos of lectures at IIT Kanpur and Impact Foundation with viewership about 10 million. Ma'am prepared study materials for various universities like Rajiv Gandhi University, Triple IT, EFL University, Sri Krishna Devraya University, B.R. Ambedkar Open University, to name a few. Ma'am has organized 50 plus seminars and workshops. To her credit, Ma'am has authored 47 books, 22 articles in national and international journals. As a resource person, Ma'am delivered around 300 lectures of UGC refresher courses, orientation programs, workshops, seminars, etc. 
happy to inform more than 1000 guest lectures and more than 200 online lectures were delivered by ma'am from April 2020 onwards. Really happy ma'am. Some of the universities for which ma'am is a PhD examiner, University of Hyderabad, English and Foreign Language University, Mumbai University, Padmavati University, Tirupati, Kakatiya University, Warangal, Coimbatore University, Andhra University, Ravindrabhati University, the list is on. Ma'am has gone as a guest faculty for the following college. Academic staff colleges in Hyderabad and other parts of India, Rajiv Gandhi University of Knowledge Technology, Madhul Channa Reddy HRD Institute, Hyderabad, National Institute of Technology, Warangal, Kendri Vidyalaya, Hyderabad and Sikandrabad, more than 150 private engineering colleges, banks, Gandhi Technics, public sectors and private organizations. Really delighted to have you here, ma'am. Once again, a hearty welcome to you. Now, I request you to take over the session. Over to you, ma'am. My greetings to all of you. And thank you, Ms. Sojanya. You have given a very long introduction. This ma is a prepared CV which I pass on. I expect you to read only one or two points. Yeah. But you have read in great detail. Ma'am, your profile itself gives kind of uh, the entire length I could be able to see. Thank you so much. It's been an honor, ma'am. I'm very happy to be with all of you because whenever I have the free time and I have the ability to meet all of you, it's wonderful to be with all young teachers who are doing a great job in, uh, you know, carrying forward this idea of teaching. Yes. Now, teaching itself is a fairly difficult term today because more or less we expect rather than teaching only helping or facilitating. Today the West is using these terms but you can understand that almost 150 years before such a term was used by Swami Vivekananda also, who said that we cannot help a child. We can, you know, we cannot teach a child. We can only help the child because the learning is done by the child herself or himself. So when you say teaching Gen Z, we say Z UK or Z, if you want to pronounce it American, then we have every generation with specific needs. So we need to keep that in mind. And for that, the teacher has to be a multifaceted individual, a unidimensional teacher or a monochrome teacher is no longer suitable. You know, in our movies, etc., we see the caricature of a classroom and a teacher and a learner, of course, but that doesn't really work today. So I must congratulate St. Anne's for taking up this idea of talking about how to facilitate, how to help the learners of the new generation. Now, we had the millennial generation. Then we had, you know, when the century was turning. Then we had the Gen X then we have what we are teaching today. You know, the college going age today is Gen Z. There are about 32 billion, I'm told, or, you know, many more billion who are of this age. Some of them are with us as our wards. And what exactly we need to do? I have tried to share some of my ideas. I will share in the next one hour or so. But please remember that all participants who are here, even if you are a teacher for a few months or one year or a few years, all of you have a classroom experience. So based on the parameters which I'm suggesting, I would like each of you to recollect one experience from your own classroom and share it. I will give a lot of time for interaction because by examples, our abilities are enhanced. 
I can tell you a lot of theory which will just evaporate from your mind. You know, there we are similar to the generation we are teaching. Unless we illustrate, unless we show by example, we are not really able to communicate the theory well. Therefore, all of you who are here, please get ready. Each of you will get two or three minutes. And I would like all of you to take this opportunity to share one example of any one of the parameters which I'm suggesting, either that you have done it or that you have tried it or that you will try because you tried something else. That example you give and you say that that was very successful. In this way, we are going to merge all the ideas of the 20, 30 people who are here into teaching better for this generation. How we are going to make education useful for this generation. That is what we are going to look at now. So let me try to share some of I, uh, the ideas which I've put down. Usually, I don't feel like sharing a PowerPoint because, uh, you know, it takes away our attention. Today, we say the Gen Z is a tech savvy age, but technology stops at a certain point. The moment you see the PowerPoint, what happens is that you are multitasking. And in this multitasking, what you're doing is you are not really paying full attention to anything, either listening or reading. Both of them are happening. But then I feel that you might find it more convenient to have the PowerPoint. Therefore, I'm giving you this PowerPoint. Plus, please understand this restricts both the speaker and the listener. So when you are using IT in your classrooms, you have to use it with some kind of another, you know, codicil, which tells you that this technology goes up to this point and beyond it, it doesn't go. I'm sure, I don't know, maybe all of you are teachers of business management and commerce. I didn't ask the participants organizers who are these participants but whichever you are teaching you might you know sometimes read for pleasure isaac asimov is a wonderful writer who writes science fiction stories so in one of his stories the fun they had it's a small you know three page four page story the children only know teacher as a mechanical teacher you know, the computer, the machine. In the attic, these children find a book. They've never seen a book. They don't know what to do with a book, how to turn the pages and all. Then they read in the book that they were human teachers in, his, in their grandfather's generation. They say, how can a human being be a teacher? Human beings are not smart enough to be a teacher. Isaac Asimov wrote this 100 years back. Today, we are seeing more and more that, you know, this, what he visualized then is actually happening, especially after the pandemic. We have realized that machines have much more, you know, all the online available material is much more. A human teacher might get irrelevant unless we adjust ourselves to the changing needs. We have artificial intelligence, AI in everything. But even today, artificial intelligence has not been able to compete with human intelligence. So it is the human intelligence which is making the artificial intelligence. Therefore, remember that we have to keep one step ahead whatever discoveries whatever progress you know we put it in inverted commas sometimes progress is regressive so we have to keep all this in mind i just have three type uh, slides which i will try to focus one by one and i will you know share my ideas but i'm looking at 
your sharing of ideas more exciting because I'm just going to stir up your thoughts. My job is, you know, only to stir it up and to see what comes out of the wonderful creative minds which all of you have. You know, we keep our creativity aside. We keep our exceptional abilities aside. We go in a very mechanical way. We say, okay, this is the syllabus, this has to be taught and so on. So that is not the way in which we should go. Today's generation requires a lot of creativity in the teachers. They require it in themselves. And you are the role model based on which they will get creativity. Therefore, let us keep this in mind. Why am I calling this pre-teaching? Pre-teaching because we require a kind of teaching learning environment which is conducive to the best of the teacher and the learner. The teacher is able to teach well and the learner is able to learn well. This idea is significant in this pre-teaching slide, which I'm focusing on at present. I hope audio and PowerPoint are all clear. At any point of time, if you run into problems, please let me know. Then I will try to, you know, the organizers will try to do some troubleshooting. The first point is very significant. If we teach from our age, you know, suppose I start talking to you from my age. I'm very old now. Recently, I went to Pune to give some lectures. And there, you know, somebody was saying, Swamiji was talking about this. He was saying that after 60, whatever we get is only a bonus. Now, you can imagine I'm 65, so this is only a bonus. But even today, if I go to teach school children, who might be only, you know, less than 16 years old. I must think like that 16 year old. I cannot think in my persona of 65 years. I cannot be a teacher for that 16 year old. I remember in my first teaching assignment, I was teaching in a private institution, small children, you know. Although I must have been 23, 24 at that time, they wanted me to, you know, play with them, sit on the merry-go-round with them. If I said, no, I'm your teacher, I can't do it, then the teaching learning would not take place because not inside the classroom is learning restricted. So the first thing we have to learn, go into the mind of this child, the child whom we are teaching. Very often we scold or punish children, our own students, without understanding what has made that child behave or commit a mistake, you know, behave badly. But that is because we are unable to do it. Every child is a counselor. Every teacher is a counselor. Every child needs this counseling before teaching. That is why in many of our systems, I don't know whether in your colleges it's there, Mentoring became compulsory. This is what UGC said that, you know, every college, every university should have the mentoring possibility. 10 or 15 of the students are allotted to each teacher, not more than that. In a class, you might have 60 to 100, but here only 10. Those 10, you get to know very well if it's an undergraduate course, three years, if it's a postgraduate course, two years. In these, this long period, you get to know the child, which is so difficult in a classroom. But we must remember that a classroom is a fairly difficult place. It's not an easy place because our role is to mold that child. How will you mold the child unless you know what the child has inherent qualities? What is there in the child? Therefore, each child has to be understood. This effort takes a lot of time and energy, and it takes, of course, a lot of um, you know interest on the part of the teacher. 
we feel we cannot do it because syllabus is heavy and so on. But let us try, you know, at least let us try so that through the peer groups, through teamwork, the students will tell us about themselves in a way which does not consume much time. I'm telling you this from experience that you can really understand your students with little effort if you put in the right tools. Then we have to next go on. Before we start teaching, now the syllabus is the same, the teacher is the same, the classroom is the same, but I'm sure all of you will agree with me that for each batch of students, we have to adapt a different methodology. The same methodology might not work for every group which we are teaching the same thing. Therefore, the second thing to know before, you know, this is all pre-teaching. We haven't begun teaching yet. Pre-teaching. We have to know their awareness level. You know, we have warm-up exercises. The first day they come, you might ask them for their name. I would tell them, tell me everything other than your name. Because your names, I might not remember. Nobody asked you before they named you. You know, no parent asked us, do you want this name? Do you prefer this name, etc. So our name is the last priority. It's only one identity. But we have much more powerful identities which are not linked to the name. You know, you heard so much about me. But that is not me at all. I am something else not restricted to that piece of paper which I circulate whenever I go for a lecture. Therefore, each child and especially uh, Generation Z or Generation Z is the generation which prefers an identity. You know, they are very, very uh, careful about their individuality. They don't want this mass kind of production. Each of them would like to be an individual. Therefore, we have to know what is the level of their awareness? What are they capable of absorbing? How much are they capable of learning? We have to ba base ourselves on that. Not feel disappointed or excited if we are doing too well or too badly or any such thing. But it all depends on them. Teaching is all about them. You know, teaching is not about us, our capabilities or our excellences. It is all about the kind of land in which we are sowing the seeds of these ideas. Then we come to the next point. What is it that interests them? You know, areas of engagement. We say, oh, when we were young, you know, this is a refrain everybody uses. When you were young, that is fine. Your elderly people were telling you, you're doing everything wrong. When we were young, we did this. Now, we are doing the same thing again. By the time you become a teacher, you say, when we were young, that was a different generation. Now it is different. I'm sure this generation of youngsters will again grow up and say, when I was young, unless you tell them to respect the engagement of each generation. This group of people have a particular background. They have a particular inward quality, which was not there 10, 20, 30 years back, which will not be there 10, 20, 30 years later. Therefore, their areas of engagement are what we should to be careful. We should not impose our level of engagement. Our areas of interest should not be imposed on them. Very often, the syllabus which is framed is a syllabus which is dated. You know, dated means it is old fashioned. The students don't need that kind of a syllabus because everything is now available. They don't really have to sit and learn that syllabus. They have to creatively implement it. Therefore, we need to know what is it that they are able to absorb awareness 
and engagement participate. Then you have this, you know, merging of two areas. I'm talking to you today because there is this virtual platform. When they called me, I said, I'm in Kolkata. I cannot come to St. Anne's. Almost every day now I'm saying no to Hyderabad because earlier I was in Hyderabad. I could go to all the places. At present, I'm in Kolkata. I can only do online. So with whichever is online, I'm doing almost every day. Whichever they want physical, I'm saying no. So what have we done here? We have seen that the virtual reality is sometimes more real. But imagine if all of us were in the same room, all of us had eye contact. I didn't have to look at my camera. You didn't have to, you know, look at your system in order to communicate. So that would be a different experience. Now, how comfortable is the youngster with this? Many people who come from a deprived background in India, even today, you know, if your participants come from a background which is very deprived, then they are not very familiar with the virtual reality. For them, the actual reality is the physical reality. I've put actual into inverted commas because I want you to realize that, you know, today we say post-truth generation. Of course, that will take me a long time to speak about. I won't mention. But then what is your truth is not exactly my truth. You know, if somebody says that a person is telling lies, the other person says, no, no, that is not a lie. That is a truth which is slightly slanted. So somebody is saying it's a lie. Somebody is saying it's a truth. So you have, you know, two versions. Everything has more than one version. So when we talk about reality, we are talking now about a physical reality and a virtual reality. The people, you know, who are affluent or who are capable of affording these uh, technological devices are more comfortable with the virtual reality. For them, the virtual world is the real world. They seem to be forgetting this physical material world. So from the materialistic dimension, they are moving on to a dimension which is non-material. A simple example, you know, when we were young, there was a black and white photograph. Today we don't have it. Then it became, you know, colored photograph, then Polaroid. Today we have only, you just click and the photos are there in the virtual platform. You don't have to go to a studio to develop your photograph anymore. It comes to you ready-made. So this is a generation which is used to that kind of a ready-made thing. For them, this ordering and getting immediately, asking and getting fulfillment immediately is what is impacting their education. You ask them to wait for six months and then appear for an examination semester, or you ask them to wait for three years and then get a degree, is not really working for them at all. That is why we have options. Now, even, you know, NEP 2020, we have options of joining somewhere in the middle, leaving somewhere in the middle, so on. You will find in many universities all over the world that they do degrees which are totally divorced from each other. Somebody is studying mathematics and studying painting, simultaneously two subjects, you know, mathematics, something which is you know, totally, uh, uh, you know, rational and painting something which is non-rational. You can't really rationalize art. Therefore, you have, it is not irrational. I'm not using the word irrational. You have these two versions which you need to talk about. Now, the classroom has to be pre-teaching. The classroom has to be more than what is there on Google or what is there available online. Not only Google, but YouTube also. And all kinds of others. I was told about another um, search engine which writes the answers and gives you. If you ask it, 
it writes. It's doing all rounds on WhatsApp. I'm sure most of you have seen. I've forgotten the name. If uh, I get a minute, I'll just search and tell you that. But these are different things from what we need to do in the classroom. So the classroom should, the teacher in the classroom and the environment in the classroom should be prepared for this onslaught. We cannot repeat what is there on Google because they can read it as well as we can. Therefore, we have to know this. Then teachers' adaptability and teachers' participation. This is very important because when we are talking about the learner, the teacher is the role model for the learner. So if the teacher is capable of learning, we teach, you know, in soft skills, we teach a skill called learning skill. So if the teacher is capable of learning, then the student learns automatically without having to force or to punish or to compel, without having to announce a test or an assignment. The student learns naturally. The student learns automatically. Because starting from birth, the newborn child is learning. You know, the child doesn't go to any school till maybe three, four years old. But every minute of each day of the child's survival in those three years is a learning graph. We have to remember this. This learning cannot stop even when we are into a profession like teaching. Today, if I stop learning, then I'm as good as dead. In 2020, April, when, you know, everybody was doing online, they said, Madam, you have to do. I said, I don't know. Then I could learn it from some young students. You know, young boys, they came, you know, and they said, step by step, you open, you do like this and so on from April 2022 to now 2020 to today's 23, online has become a part of our life. Therefore, adaptability. Many of my colleagues, my age group, they said we cannot do online, so don't call us online. And participation, you know, when a student is able to do something, then you must be able to do that something equally well or better. You know, we say younger generation is very tech savvy. I remember my professor saying, I cannot use an ATM card. Can you go and get my pension for me? So I would take the ATM card and go and get the pension. I said, what happens if I steal your money and run away? You know, only as a joke, of course. Therefore, we have to understand that for teaching this generation, for teaching anybody, in fact, we need adaptability, we need participation. Unless we can do this, you know, unless we can introspect. This generation is highly introspective, we have to remember. So we need to introspect in order to be able to take them up. Now we move on to the next few points some strategies for structuring the teaching learning ecosystem. So first is we prepared the ground. You know, now we are seeing that everything is conducive to our learning. So what is it that we are teaching? The syllabus is what we are teaching, obviously. But the syllabus is not going to be very helpful for this generation, especially because all mechanical professions, professions which are repetitive work of the same variety, are going to go absolutely out. They will not be able to put themselves in situations where they keep repeating. You know, earlier we had a teller in the bank. Today we don't need a teller. There's a machine which is counting your notes and telling you, that there are 100 notes or 50 notes or whatever. There are machines for doing so many things, which, you know, our generation saw the happening. You know, I remember when television came first to Hyderabad, the kind of excitement we had as youngsters. Today, you don't really have to depend on television. 
they're telling us that smartphones now will come in a paper format. So you don't really require a machine smartphone. It will be like paper. Yesterday, I visited some business and they were showing me how by just putting a you know, business card next to the smartphone, not on the camera side, just touching it, all data can be transferred. This is the all new technology that is coming. So we have to, in this technological world, are we becoming machines or are we still human? This is the first thing that teaching this generation implies. So we have to give them a holistic development of which a small percentage is the syllabus. Because when they go out, you know, I must have studied so many things in school and college. Could I use it? You must have studied so many things in school and college. They have made your personality. They have made you capable of certain basic functions of survival. But they have not enhanced the quality of your life. Therefore, if we put ourselves into the shoes of this younger generation, the Z or the Z generation, then what do we find? We find that the first thing we have to do is needs analysis. Needs analysis is like a survey, you know. You take some of these youngsters, frame a questionnaire, ask them to answer these questions orally or in writing, honestly and truthfully. Then you can understand what aspect of their lives requires more attention. So what are the needs they have? These have to be devised by individual teachers for different groups of students differently. It cannot be that one size fits all. You know, earlier we had what was called as tailor-made outfits, you know, dresses which are made to our size. That is what we need to do now, education made to their size. Because this ready-made culture which we have today is not going to suit this generation. So physical, intellectual, emotional, familial, you know, the family is the microcosm, then society, then occupational, their careers, and of course, spiritual, their ability to look beyond what is the reality as they know it. These are all areas which make the holistic education. Holistic education implies good health in all these aspects. So physical, intellectual, emotional, familial, social. You know, sometimes the familial health is very bad. It impacts the child. The growing up child sees a lot of negatives in the family, grows up in a stunted you know, handicapped way, mentally disturbed. Similarly, so society, so many negatives in society. You get so much, you know, on WhatsApp, which is forwarded. Then after two days, another message comes. That is fake. Please don't believe what I have forwarded. So we have become like machines. We are just, you know, passing on propaganda we are passing on something which is not fact-checked. Therefore, growth at all levels is stopped. When we do needs analysis, not from ourselves, you know, we can never know the needs of the youngsters. So we have to sit with them, analyze. Imagine if curriculum framers were doing this, then we would get a vibrant curriculum. We are hoping that NEP 2020 will bring in a lot of changes. But remember, NEP 2020 was not done by Generation Z. It wasn't done by these youngsters. It was again done by very senior, very, you know, uh, people with great achievements, etc., who were put in the committee. But are they these children? No. Do they know what these children require? I don't know. You will implement it and you will know what changes are there. 
So this needs analysis, which I'm suggesting that each of us, that is, you know, each teacher who is going to each of the classes, this we have to look at. We need to do it ourselves. It, it is not a very long process. It can be done in 10 minutes. If you have a good set of questions, you can finish it in 10 minutes and then you can begin teaching because you will know exactly on what to focus. Whatever is your syllabus, your focus can be changed because nobody teaches a syllabus. I'm sure all teachers will agree with me that we all interpret a syllabus in a classroom. Each of us, suppose there are five teachers in your department, all of you are teaching the same topic with five different methodologies five different styles. Therefore, we don't really teach the syllabus. We interpret the syllabus. Therefore, this interpretation is important for us once we have the needs analysis. Then they will grow up into holistic, educated beings. Today, our uh, you know youngsters who are passing through our hands are very fragmented. They are very incapable because the rate of employment is about 15 to 17% and the satisfaction graph, you know, happiness or satisfaction graph, India is at the bottom, you know, very, very low in the list of countries. So it is all because we are not giving them what they require and what they enjoy. One is what they require, you know, good health. But always we cannot give the bitter pill. We have to also give them something which they require in a pleasant, enjoyable format. This is what is the challenging job for the teacher. You know, teaching is the most wonderful profession because every day is like a new experiment. Every day is like an exciting, in uh, you know, adventure into something which is so, so rewarding. The ability of the student, the success of the student, I think is the greatest reward for the teacher. So when we want that, we have to give them this holistic education. Now, the next point is, you know, how do we move? Already in the first slide, we saw that we know what is their attitude and what is their behavior. So from the known, to the unknown, we take them into areas which they do not know, telling them what they already know, what they already might have heard or read, or they might have, uh, you know, looked through online is not really education. We have to tell them that extra percentage, which is not available anywhere. So we have to be very aware of what is there in the virtual platforms. Unless we know it, we really cannot, um, you know, uh, teach them at all from the known to the unknown, from the familiar to the unfamiliar. Since I'm an English teacher, I'm giving you some examples from literature, but you can get these examples everywhere. You know, if you teach a poem where the flower is mentioned daffodils, famous poem by Wordsworth. So I cannot tell my uh, younger generation that daffodils, they don't grow in India. So what I can do, I can tell them, okay, you can Google daffodils and you will find what they are. What about the emotion? What about the learning, the values? These, they have to experience. So if you are telling them something unfamiliar, then it has to grow from what they know. We have a term, culture specificity. So today, educational curriculum framers are giving a lot of importance to cultural specificity. I won't go into this because you are not going, you know, at present curriculum framers. Since we are on various committees, we keep thinking of these things. So what I'm trying to put to you is that if a child coming from a rural background 
knows only this much, then that familiar thing should be the leap into the unfamiliar. The child in the city knows that much more and it has to go further. These problems are there everywhere. I remember in IIT Kanpur, the director was asking me that 50% students come from the city from very rich, high society. 50% come from rural backgrounds, brilliant result, but no awareness. So how do we merge these two groups? They keep, you know, getting disheartened. They keep comparing with each other and they get disheartened. This kind of a situation happens in all our classes. So we have to start with what is familiar. We can't go on to the unfamiliar completely. And there, the teacher's role, the individual teacher's role in an individual classroom is important. I'm not telling any of these points as general points. Please understand. These have to be tried out in your classroom before they are validated, before you can say, okay, this works. Without that, it is not possible for us to validate. Now, we have to remember that when we are talking in terms of uh, what is known, what is familiar, how much are, is there awareness, etc., we are talking about human interaction. Teaching, learning is one of the greatest relationships which we have. I'm sure in our culture, we revere the teacher as God. You know, we say Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, and so on. So what we are trying to do is to say that the profession of teaching is like creating a new human being. It is like molding. It is like, you know, bringing up somebody uh, I would uh, like the questions to remain till the end. Please uh, put them in the chat box. I will not stop now and uh, answer your questions, but I will certainly answer all your questions. Since the question is in the chat box, may I continue? Yes, ma'am, please. So then we come to the next point, and that is the comfort level. You know, all of us, including teachers and students and human beings, we all have comfort levels, whatever we can do very well. As a teacher who's done it for decades, my comfort level is teaching. Now, if you ask me to sit and listen, I might find very difficult to listen to somebody else teaching or lecturing because my comfort zone is teaching. Similarly, Students have their own comfort zone. And we have to expand the comfort zone. We have to bring them out of that comfort zone because that comfort zone is where they are inactive. They are not using their capabilities. The comfort zone is where we are living on whatever capabilities we already have. What is, you know, we call as, you know, a lot of past experience. That comfort zone is not a very good idea at all. It is deadening. Since we are in NEP, we are supposed to use a lot of Indian concepts. I'm using various Indian terms. You know, this is what we call as tamasic. Tamasic is not really something negative. It is that we are very comfortable with wherever we are. We don't want to be active. We don't want to be dynamic. This idea is what is the comfort zone. So we need to expand. This happens slowly. You know, little by little we expand. Some students are there who can learn anything by heart. You know, recently my seven-year-old cousin who's in the U.S., you know, born and brought up, is reciting a 10-minute, 20-minute shloka from memory. I said, wow, what memory power, comfort zone, memory power. So you have to get them out of the memory power and ask them to read. You know, reading becomes a difficult thing because everything becomes memorized. Therefore, 
we have to look at the comfort zone and we have to expand the comfort zone. Teaching your own subject, you know, there might be some students who are good at your subject. They are in a comfort zone. You have to challenge them constantly with more and more information, more and more tasks in your subject. If there are others who are finding your subject very difficult and failing, etc., that means they haven't reached the comfort zone in your subject. There they need extra help so that you pull them out of their comfort zone, which might be some other subject or some other activity, not education, and put them into this comfort zone. Students who are with us for three years, on the day of the farewell party, they are very upset. What happens to them is they don't want to leave college, which is their comfort zone. They are comfortable here where three years back they didn't want to come at all. They came to college with reluctance because their comfort zone was in the plus two level. So you can imagine by expanding our comfort zones, we are learning so much more. And this kind of learning is a powerful experience. Then we have generating interest in new experiences. Learning should be experiential. You know that I think in the next slide also I have put again. Experiential learning is the only learning which we should have. If it is only intellectual learning, then it does not stay for long. If you find your students working globally, you will hear one complaint from them that, you know, our employers say that we are excellent in theory, but our practical knowledge is very bad. We are not able to do. We are able to say. We are able to understand. But saying and understanding is not so important as actively engaging. Therefore, experiential how to make your subject experiential that is what you have to do now all these you have to apply to your own subjects at the beginning itself i told you that i'm going to expect a lot of input from you with real examples if you were a group of only english teachers you know i would have shared with one example for each with you but if you are commerce, management, or uh, you know, accountancy, finance, etc., I don't know those subjects. For me, they are unfamiliar. Therefore, I have to depend on you to substantiate, to illustrate whatever I am telling you. I'm telling you my point of view. But my point of view need not be your point of view. You might have an experience in the classroom which is different from what I'm telling you. Therefore, you need to share these. I have finished, of course, close to one hour, but I'll take a little more time. And whatever time remains, you know, I can go on talking for two, three, four hours. We are teachers after all. We love speaking. But my speaking is deadening for, you know, your teaching experience. Just listening to me is not going to help you. Thinking about what I have said, trying to recollect a e real classroom experience is going to be much more valuable. That two minutes sharing is going to be equal to this one hour listening. One hour, whatever I've said, and two minutes, whatever you've thought up, are equal in the balance. So you can imagine that is what is called interactive or experiential or, you know, the center has altered, not, not like this. In fact, whenever I go for, you know, the, these faculty training programs, I'm telling all the organizers that give, you know, if the participants are 20, 40, 60, however many there are, give the speaker only about half an hour or 45 minutes and give about two, three hours for the participants so that the participants can air their experiences 
50 of you giving 50 examples would be much more enriching than one person giving examples. I'm sure you can understand. And since we live in a democracy, we know the power of the multitude. We don't live in an autocracy. Therefore, each of you, please start thinking. This is the last of the slides I'm showing you. And now I have come to the crux of the topic, how to teach them, in what manner should we go. But I'm not calling it teaching because, you know, I'm calling it learning. When we teach them, we learn a lot. When we teach them, we assume they also learn a lot. This is important. Now, earlier, it was always teacher-centric classroom. You know, the teacher would come. I have, I remember in my college days, teachers coming, sitting with their eyes closed in the classroom and teaching for the full hour with eyes closed. We were very mischievous, of course, and we used to do all kinds of mischief. That is, that lecture method is no longer applicable. If you give a small explanation, your student will say, oh, I know already all this. There are wonderful lecture videos on YouTube exactly on this subject. So learner centric. Each of you, I'm sure from different colleges all over India, I don't know the participant profile today, but I'm assuming since it's online, you're from different parts of the country, each of you can prepare. If you are good at your subject, if you're good at facing the camera, you can prepare your own lecture series and put it up on the YouTube. Not only your students of your college, but students all over the world will benefit. So if the student is already getting the lecture which you are giving on YouTube, either by you or by some other teacher, very well explained, you know, with all kinds of uh, supports and props, all kinds of ICT enabled documents, we don't really require the lecture method. So teacher centric goes completely. Now learner centric, what would learner centric mean? Learner centric would mean that we have to give more time and more participation, more abilities to interact to the student than doing it ourselves. For instance, you want to do a lesson today. So you tell them this is the lesson. This is in brief a summary of what it is. Now, dividing the class into groups, tell them that group one does this part of it. Group two does this part of it. Group three does this part of it. And you come to class tomorrow. They all work hard, you know, in teams they work. They have to come and make the presentation of the syllabus, of that topic in your syllabus from their point of view. Once the entire presentation of all the groups is finished, you supplement whatever they have missed out. You add what they could not find anywhere. You tell them where they can get more information. You give them a study list. So your job is not necessarily to, you know, just by rote tell them what is that topic and how they should write it in the exam. Your idea and your job is to bring out what they understood from within their learning rather than telling them. You know, that is the parent kind of thing. <clears throat> this idea is not something which um, we have now. So learner-centric does not mean that we are keeping learner in focus. We are giving the stage to the learner in the classroom. Here, you can use another uh, you know, uh, strategy that is called team teaching. So you have two students who are you know, always uh, inattentive in the class because whatever you're telling them, they already know and so on. So you form a team with them. You say you, I as a teacher and all of you as students, two or three of you, let us sit here. 
let us have a panel discussion on the topic which we are going to you know learn today and each of the students in the class <coughs> can join the panel if you want so what are we doing we are giving them some activity which keeps them away from their mischief very often you know they say especially engineering colleges they say the students are very mischievous they don't listen to us they don't listen possibly because they are very brilliant they are very intelligent and you are boring them or they don't listen because they cannot understand they are so weak in the subject that they are unable to follow in both cases you have to address it from their point of view that is what is learner centric now the next point is context centric how are we going to use it in a context you know certain subjects are very current i remember when e-commerce was introduced in usmania university nobody knew what is e-commerce why are they introducing e-commerce this may be you know 30 years back today we hardly go to a shop it is all amazon you know we keep ordering it's all flipkart or blinkit you know we have these uh, apps through which we are shopping so you can imagine e-commerce the student was equipped with e-commerce at that point of time which is futuristic so a context centric education would mean that you are aware of the global trends you are aware of the future possibilities and you are preparing this child for the future possibilities within the narrow limit of your syllabus the syllabus is limited but each of us can expand that syllabus because we have to have our awareness we have to have that passion which will make us feel better you know when i started my research on soft skills people all laughed at me they said what are you doing what soft skills there's nothing like soft skills today everybody is teaching soft skills i did this maybe 20 30 years back ugc gave a lot of money for this i related it to the teaching of english to the teaching of uh, you know indian philosophic prose in english all these parameters because i did not know that it would become so popular so soon so you can imagine this kind of passion this kind of a research orientation we have to put into the student i remember when i was director of uh, the international program center in usmania university we got a grant from the usa they said whoever you know undergraduate level first year undergraduate or second year undergraduate student can do research you give them this grant as a summer grant i searched all over india where in political science department research is being done at the undergraduate level i found nothing we have great colleges all over india in big cities in small places in big universities i could not find two students to whom i could give that you know grant the grant was there with me for a long time after a couple of years of you know training them then we could get two girls so you can imagine we are not giving them this research orientation this is the context centric point which we require think for yourself what is research research is generating new ideas from the ba on the basis of old ideas remember what isaac newton said he said that i can see further because i'm standing on the shoulders of giants metaphorically all scientists are giants he's standing on their shoulder that means earlier knowledge he's building on that knowledge that is the context centric area which we have to introduce to this generation then we have the games every subject now every topic every syllabus every discipline can have games and if you have interdisciplinary research and interdisciplinary games that is wonderful 
For instance, again, I'm giving you example only from English. You go to the uh, you know Play Store, you will find so many games for vocabulary. You will find so many games for grammar. You will find so many games for uh, you know uh, pronunciation. All these are what we teach in the classroom. But if we teach it through games, the learning becomes better. Today, gamification is a very important strategy. And all of them, the uh, generation, you know, this new generation which is with us, they are all the time playing games online. You will find they are sitting with their own tablets. They are either playing games or they are chatting or they are, you know, uh, TikTok or Instagram or any of those things. So gamification and tech support. This tech support in our learning is very important. Instead of doing it ourselves, we can ask them to do it. Again, I'm giving you an example from myself. I hope it is encouraging all of you to share your examples, your experiences. You know, while teaching, MA students usually go for teaching jobs. So while teaching how to teach a poem or how to teach prose or how to teach language, I would constantly tell them to make use of their smartphones. I said, don't, uh, you know, there is no rule here saying you can't use smartphone. In the class, you use the smartphone. Let us see if you can find anything which is tech supported learning for your topic. Then I told them to prepare games to test each other. So each group would make a game to test the knowledge of the other parts of the class. Then I told them to teach the students of other subjects. You know, this is MA English I was teaching. In Arts College, Usmani University, you have so many subjects. There is history, there is political science, there is economics, there is journalism, there is archaeology, there is philosophy, psychology. All these students need English because most of them are from rural backgrounds. So bring them and start teaching them. So applying all these methods, you know, the learner centric gets peer learning, which is wonderful. They learn from each other. They don't have a teacher who's an elderly person. They interact with each other much better, sharing much more. Therefore, these are, you know, these all these things can be blended together. And that is the term I'm using. Of course, blended learning today implies hybrid learning. Hybrid means online, offline. So this is comfortable. Many people feel that, you know, online was terrible. Nobody learned anything. Then I suggested that why don't you give them a task which they perform online? You won't believe I was taking some English classes for a group of teachers <coughs> who, of course, wanted to improve English. And they created a whole drama on the wastage of water. You know, they created the play. And online, it was an online class. They enacted the play online, sitting in their own houses. The play was written sitting in their own houses because that was the lockdown period, the terrible times of the pandemic. Nobody met anybody. They discussed. They wrote the play. They divided the roles amongst each other. And they enacted it in English to show their proficiency in the language. They made mistakes, no doubt about it. But you can imagine how the blended method has the benefit of both online and offline. Blended method gives us the ability to get global audiences, to get global experts. Recently, St. Anne's College of Education had an international um, conference. So I said, I won't be in Hyderabad. I will be in Kolkata. They got from Australia and Nigeria and nobody came to Hyderabad. They all did it online. 
So this blended method of teaching would help you to get experts in the field into your classroom. Not only playing a video, but playing a live uh, uh, lecture or, you know, a live question answer session with some expert who is known to you, but who is not in your city, who's not in your college. Blended learning has great advantages. You are speaking to them in a physical classroom. You are getting your colleague to talk to them in the online mode. They get two perspectives. They compare it, they research it, and they make their own perspective. You are making them think, and therefore, that is wonderful. Then we have the flipped classroom. The flipped classroom has become a very popular concept today that you know, what I told you in learner centric is similar to what flipped classroom is. They do all the studies at home and they do the work in the class. Usually we used to teach and ask them to do homework, you know, assignment at home. But now the assignment is done in the class and the learning is happening at home. So you say, OK, I have recorded this lecture for you. I'm giving it to you on WhatsApp. Please listen. I have given you the assignment. You please read up and come. Now, if you want to read it up at home, you will have to come here and you have, will have to work it out. Question is also there. Lesson is also there. Everything is there with you. You do the reading at home. This becomes the flipped classroom. That is, you are. they expect you only to teach here and do all the work at home assignment. Not necessary. You make them do the work. Assignment can be an open book assignment in the classroom. It need not be a learn by heart wrote assignment. The open book is much tougher because open book can also be using the smartphone. You know, everything is available on Google. But to find the right information, you have to be familiar with what you're looking for. Similarly, in a library, you ask them to go to the library and write the exam. There are millions of books. Which books to refer to requires familiarity. So you can imagine how you are making them individuals, how you are giving them an identity. And this is what the Gen Z is looking for. They are looking for you to respect their identity. They are looking for you to think that, yes, here is a capable individual to whom I have to only give some kind of support and stability. I don't have to spoon feed. This faith in the younger generation is what they are looking for. Then, of course, experiential or hands-on, you know, to do that I have told you already. Everything to do. Usually, to do can be also for building team skills. You give a problem and you ask a group to solve it. So they learn to work with each other. Gen Z is very comfortable with group work. And they often do the group work on social media. They don't, don't really sit with each other. Their capabilities with you know the social media, with the virtual media, is unthinkable. So they are using it. But this hands-on thing is wonderful. It is certainly important that they experience. So whatever is your subject, <clears throat> try to bring as much experience as possible. Recently in a college, I met a history teacher. So she was saying that I'm taking, we have two days holidays, I'm taking them to a district. I said, I've never heard of this place. What is there? They said, no, it is not very famous, but it has some very ancient terracotta temples. So imagine how much research a teacher would have to do to find such a hands-on experience for the student, unless we know we cannot really tell them. Therefore, we need to understand, we need to know. This, how we can transform each of these. You know, in BA, they used to teach a lesson plan. In college, we don't have a concept of lesson plan. But imagine 
all the planning which we are doing for this Gen Z is the plan which we have to think based on our syllabus, our subject, the topic we have to teach, all these frames need to fit in. Then, of course, learning from life. We have to give them this skill. Unless we tell them that, you know, you observe and then you learn. Remember when you were in school in your botany class, they must have asked you to plant a seed. And after seven days, you bring that seed to class. So some people would get, you know, a nice green shoot. Some would get a very bad one because they never looked after the seed. This is how it is happening. That learning from life. Don't believe that a seed grows into a plant. Believe what you see. Believe what you are experiencing. Believe what you see others experiencing. There's so much to be learned from, you know, movies, television, um, uh, YouTube, anything that you want to know, you know, how to repair this, how to mend this, say search YouTube. In YouTube, there is everything. WhatsApp is called as a WhatsApp university. You know, you can learn anything and everything. But are we really geared to that learning, to that positive needs analysis which i told you in the previous slide to fulfilling those needs this is what we need to think about unless we think about this we are not going to be able to identify what this younger generation this gen z is looking towards us for because with them you know we become young again we as we teach, we remain young. So that is the idea. With that passion, with that research orientation, with that great desire to make a holistic being out of each student who passes through our hands, we begin this teaching learning process. And once the process has successfully gone through, I'm sure the rewards are plentiful. OK, now uh, I will leave the mic and the session to all of you. We have about uh, 40 minutes left. And I can see 54 in the participants list. So maybe one minute each. Okay, one person has a question. Uh, let me just talk about it. Needs of students are different. How a teacher can satisfy everyone. One is that, you know, the needs of a single generation are more or less similar. They are not exactly antithetical to each other you know the problem comes when two people have two uh, completely of opposing schemes yeah. that is not really what happens therefore we have to look for first for the general needs when you are beginning needs analysis for a first month or you know for first two weeks talk uh, focus on the general needs the commonest need among the largest group. Slowly, as they find that you are addressing the needs, they will themselves clarify their needs. They will, you know, with peer interaction, they will hone the needs which require uh, no answer. They will only tell you about needs which need your help. So taking the students as our team members, that is the most important part. <clears throat> Team members are not only our colleagues. They are our students. The divide between teacher student, you know, I'm on a higher pedestal, student in on a lower pedestal doesn't work anymore. We are all in that horizontal space where we are learning from each other. Very often, if we honestly say, 
there are many things we as teachers learn from our students on a daily basis. Very often, our teaching style also is much affected by the student response. Therefore, first try with the common needs and then go on to individual needs. As I told you, if one student has a specific need which nobody else has, practice mentoring, it goes beyond teaching. <coughs> okay. Now, somebody says that um, certificate should be given. That, of course, they will give. So I have nothing to do. Now, if you have said thank you, thank you, I'm very happy. That is fine. But I'm looking for a lot of participation from all of you. Either you can raise your hand or the organizers will, uh, you know, unmute you. Or if uh, you put the share what you want to share in the chat box, I can read it out. I'm happy to have one session from you. I have one question. You have already addressed, I feel, but you were just telling about uh, we work uh, uh, as a college under Usmania University affiliated. We have our deadlines of completing our syllabus. Though they say four months as a semester, we hardly get 75 days to complete five units as a subject. They don't decrease a subject added. I, I teach IT and HR subjects. A practical is also been added. It's really a tough time to fit the entire syllabus in that 75 days. And we don't leave any stone unturned also because they may think that we left any topic. So how do we actually deal it? You know, the problem is that we are trying to explain to the students every aspect of the syllabus without considering whether they know this already or not. If they do not know, before you start a topic, you ask them to read up whatever is available on that subject. You can tell them the sources from which they can read up. Then you will have a lot of time and a lot of participation by your students. We don't do that. In a traditional classroom, any college of Osmani University, any of the affiliated colleges, and maybe other colleges all over the country, we are constantly thinking that finishing the syllabus is the teacher's job. But that is not the teacher's job at all. Finishing the syllabus is the job of the teacher and the student combined. Therefore, uh, we have to remember that the student has to be involved in this finishing, you know, finishing the syllabus. And finishing it, as you said, every aspect of it so why are you taking the responsibility alone when you have such a group of bright intelligent students and such a plethora of material available online have you tried all of you or you know even one or two of you who have asked have you tried involving your student in the process of lecture delivery you know, not telling them everything that is there to be told, but expecting them to tell and supplementing. You try it, you will find that in those four months or 75 classes, you will get much more, you know, learning than you will get if you finish the syllabus. You know, finish means cut off the syllabus. Yes, That's what we are doing. Most of us are doing it in such a way that the student says, oh, college life was so boring. <laughs> this should not happen because we are not challenging their intellect. We are not challenging their capabilities. We are not, we are saying, oh, it's a large class. So what if it's a large class? If you have 75 classes, you know, 75 hours of teaching, then you divide the class into five groups. Suppose you have 50 students, that is 10 students. If you have 100 students, that is 20 students. Divide them into groups. And in these 75 classes, if you're going to do five topics or 10 topics, divide the topics among the groups on day one of your 
syllabus. You know, the starting day you say that this is the mode of teaching which we have here. I'm going to tell you only supplementary information because all this information you can find somewhere. I will tell you where all you can find. If you want, I can share the links of the articles and the videos with you. You will see it in your free time. And as a group, you will make a presentation. So the topic which you're going to start tomorrow, you have told them today. Tomorrow, it begins with the presentation. Suppose you're teaching 10 topics, then you have seven classes for each topic. You have given of these seven classes, you if you give them two or three classes, or if you give them half a class and take the other half yourself, you will find that the syllabus is covered from all aspects. All things which you might not have mentioned are also finding mention because there are 10 different minds thinking on that, reading up on that, and doing a little bit of research and experimentation on that and speaking. This is what learner-centric education is. We are trying learner-centric education for many, many years, not only Gen, Gen Z, but many others also. But that has not taken hold. It has absolutely uh, not taken hold. Therefore, you can, uh, you know, certainly do this to them. Give them the resources. Give them everything. Let them read up. They will not be able to read and understand everything. So there'll be lots of gaps in what they say. Those gaps you fill in by giving them extra information which they did not give. These days, recording is at the, our fingertips, you know. A student can pick up the smartphone and start recording in the class. Let them record what you have said, what they have said. Let them put it together and see how much learning has taken place. What you required seven hours, I'm sure you can finish in five hours. It is a very dynamic and very participatory. Nobody is sitting in the classroom like that. You know, that traditional classroom with the teacher sitting on one side and the students sitting on the other side, galleries in arts college, you know, galleries and the teacher's podium slightly higher. Those things don't work anymore. We need to move around. We need to create a system where excessive discipline is actually in discipline. You know, earlier we used to say discipline means they should sit quietly and listen to us. Our teachers would say, look at me also. <laughs> now it is not like that anymore. Now their attention span is very less. Their ability to, you know, distinguish this vertical hierarchy is zero. They don't have these skills. Why are we expecting them to have something which they don't have? But they have very active minds. Because the mind is so active, it is involved in so many different multitasking. Can we as teachers bring the focus of the mind into the classroom? This is our challenge. And give them more and more work to do so that they don't have time to breathe at all. You know, this should be your assignment pattern. Not finishing the lecture and giving them one question saying, this is your assignment. No, that is not what I'm talking about at all. I'm saying that even before the lesson begins, you know, I'm taking some MA classes for Satisai University online. So before I start a text, I tell them, tomorrow I'm going to start a text. You please read once and you tell me what is the text mean to you? How much have you understood of the text before I give my ideas and your ideas get wiped out? They get oppressed. So don't allow my mind to suppress your mind. Your mind is equally intelligent. If I tell you about a, a topic of my syllabus, then you start thinking like me. We don't want clones, you know, we want individuals. These youngsters are individuals. So why are we cloning them in our own intellectual pattern? Give them that much freedom. If you try it, 
at least out of 10 topics, you try it for one or two topics on an experimental basis and then take the feedback of the students saying, which one did you enjoy more? Did you enjoy my lecturing or did you enjoy your participative learning? I'm sure the answer is obvious. Thank you, ma'am. Good, good afternoon, ma'am. This is Dr. Sucharita from St. Anne's. Okay. Ma'am, in the context of uh, the syllabus-centric uh, teaching, uh, ma'am, don't you feel that the method of evaluation has to change if we have to implement all these uh, new strategies? See, we have no control over evaluation and we should not tell the learner that their goal is only to get an A grade or an O grade. That is not the goal. The goal is, have they learned? You know, that is the goal. A student who has just got, you know, a B or a C will sometimes have a better career graph than a student who is O or A or A plus. This, you, I'm sure you have seen yourself. So the goal itself has to be rethought. Is it the examination that we are, you know, exam centric? That is another way of uh, teaching, you know, another methodology, teaching methodology is examination centric. Now, if it is examination centric, what happens is they at the end of the semester, they, you know, write everything in the answer sheet. Next semester, you start by asking them a couple of questions. They say, I don't remember. That was last semester. I have forgotten. So it is like, you know, learning today, forgetting tomorrow. That is not the kind of teaching which helps them. In life, we have to learn some things which are going to keep, you know, which are going to be with us forever. So if we are learning this, it is important. If we use this strategies, you know, the learner centric or the experiential strategies, you will find that the students learning and performance in the exam also is improving. I'm not telling you to do it all at once. I'm telling you to do it cautiously for a little. Suppose you do it with 20% of the syllabus or 30% of the syllabus the student still has 70% of the syllabus to get a good result. You follow the traditional method. Then you evaluate whether your 30% or 20% which you did experimental, which you did learner-centric, can has got a better result or has got an equal result. Okay, not better, but equal. You know, we have to also change the comfort zone of the student which says that whatever ma'am says, whatever she says is important, I will write in the exam, then I need not think about it. If you ask them, how did you do the exam? It says, I don't know. The examiner will tell me how I did. These are all deadening strategies. You know, this is what makes the student unemployable. Today, not unemployability, which is a great problem in India, but under employability. People are highly qualified. They are doing small jobs, smaller jobs than their qualification because their qualification is not equal to their competence. They have a degree or a post-graduation or a research degree, but their capabilities are not equal to their what the paper says. So we are looking to in, enhance their capability because the examination result does not get them into anything. They have to appear for a screening test. They have to appear for an interview, et cetera, et cetera, for their career. Your marks memo is not guarantee for any career for them. So if you are concentrating on your marks memo, if you are telling them to concentrate on their marks memo, then they will continue to be underemployed, underperforming, and underliving, you know, if I can use such a term. They are not really going to get that elusive term called success. 
because we have not done what we were supposed to do and that is make them stand on their feet i began with vivekananda now i will tell you you know vivekananda describes education as something which makes the student stand on his or her own feet standing on his or her own feet meaning not depending on others not depending on something so in the classroom in the first year undergraduate course when the child is only in the teens can we make them independent learners can we make them motivated learners so that they are not dependent on us very often we find that students continue to depend on the teachers years after they have uh, you know qualified i remember my own research supervisor having students who were you know did research 10 years before me asking him what paper to write i was going for a seminar i was just you know first year in the university job so he said do you need some help i said no no why will i need your help i will go and present my own paper and come which means that he was a teacher who had made me independent as a researcher this is what we have to do with our undergraduate students also if we are capable of doing this if we can devote that much of uh, our energy to strategizing how to make you know all of them take the responsibility all of them share our responsibility that is what i suggested earlier also in the earlier question then you will find learning is wonderful slowly from 20% you can go on to 40% then you can go on to 50% this will take a few years whatever i have suggested will not happen in one day of course i am doing all the talking time is getting over i haven't heard many of your other voices your wonderful ideas i would be very happy to hear all of you okay uh, manav jyoti bishash will you uh, unmute them uh the abilities has been given ma'am actually for them okay okay you can uh, unmute yourself manav jyoti bishash please turn on your mic ma'am sorry we are just trying to give it ma'am okay okay ma'am ma'am we gave the ability good afternoon uh, <clears throat> ma'am i have a uh, certain query to ask you uh, ma'am uh, i am a uh, english lecturer <clears throat> from assam and uh, while discussing certain topics in the class uh, in the post graduation class i find that uh, the the male students they are particularly interested in one topic whereas the uh, female students they are not at all interested in that topic so uh, for example certain topics like uh, feminism the male students they are not much interested i have to bring examples from their own personal life uh, explain them the gender domains and all such things where is it very easy for the female students to understand those things and to relate it uh, they take very much interest in those topics whereas they don't take uh, interest in topics like national uh, nationalism or marxism cultural materialism so is there any like a uh, proper way where i can draw both their interest equally this is a very good question let me try to uh, tell you what is important you know in the first slide if you remember i shared ideas like levels of awareness here very important is the level of social uh, you know identity so women starting thinking as women men start thinking as men that is a social construct this whole gender concept is a psychological socio psychological concept therefore we have to undermine this before we start you know their awareness is such that i am a man but when they come into the class 
they are neither men nor women they are not girls or boys they are genderless minds you know the body is not learning it is the mind which is learning nobody would have told them that at the level of the intellect at the level of the uh, spirit no gender works you know gender the sexual aspect is only the biological aspect the physical aspect the mind does not have a gender the masculine mind is not a different kind of structure the feminine mind is not a different kind of structure it is the same thing because they don't have social pressures have made them feel like this that you know this is our area of interest this is not our area of interest that is point number 1 point number 2 is that knowledge is objective when we are talking about knowledge gaining knowledge or systems of knowledge we are talking about an objective criteria taking the example which you have given you know feminism in the department many people would do research you know on women writers the researcher was a woman the writer was a woman and they would feel as though it is a subjective concept i disabuse them i said when you are a researcher you are not a man or a woman you are an intellect an objective intellect you are not you know constrained by your gender identity your gender identity is to be kept outside the classroom and then you have to come in this kind of a background this kind of system is necessary only you know what i said about needs analysis you have done very beautifully that is why i have given i thought this was a good question this is the needs analysis they are not capable of realizing that they are something more than men and women none of us who are here today you know i am a lady who is talking to you but i am not talking to you as a woman i am talking to you only as an intellect and i am addressing your intellect i am not addressing you as men or women or you know any such thing this has to be disabused this is the job of the teacher there are many aspects of our teaching which we do without considering all the, these so the students awareness the students background the students experiences if the child is brought up from childhood by saying you're a girl do this you're a girl do that you're a boy don't do this you're a boy don't do that then they have only one identity and that is i'm a girl or i'm a boy as a teacher you have to break them out of that comfort zone that they are girls you will find in a classroom you know that girls cry very easily they want attendance they will start crying so please give attendance boys will not cry because they have been told from childhood that boys don't cry they will come and break one or two tables and say give attendance so what have we done this is called social engineering you know we have socially engineered them to become like robots they are not humans anymore they are robotic in their responses <coughs> we need to address these things before as teachers we need to you know do a lot of you see in <coughs> needs analysis i started with the physical physical intellectual emotional all these have to be done you will find some students you know looking very depressed all the time some students are over excited some are hilarious some are always serious these are the in, in emotional imbalances no part of your syllabus deals with this but you as a teacher need to deal with it you cannot allow them to have these imbalances and still be objective learners i hope i am able to give some points to 
Uh, yes, ma'am. I try to constantly make them aware of their uh, gender roles. Uh, like very recently, I have asked the male students, like, uh, what type of uh, wife, like, do they expect they will have in the future? Like, what are the qualities they expect? And after their answers, I try to ask the like the uh, uh, women, uh, the women students, the uh, girl students, uh, whether they agree to the to their answers and i make them uh, like argue for a moment and like make them realize uh, like what they're expecting may not be the exact thing that the girls they want to give and i want them uh, more to question whether the rules that they are following like maybe you have said that they have simply one identity i try to question them like uh, how will you identify yourself if i ask uh, to give your identification how will you identify yourself? Will you give your name? Will you give some institution's name? Will you give your religion's name? And do you think that these are the things that identify you? Uh, do you think that your thoughts are your thoughts? Or do you think whether they are these thoughts are being influenced? So I try my best, ma'am, to make them question. Yes. Try to now give them, instead of making them separately question like men and women about marriage, give them a single concept where this gender issue doesn't play at all. You know, try to challenge their minds to think. Ch try to challenge their identity coming out of this gender constraint. Marriage, of course, is a physical relationship. Therefore, you need to have men and women. You have same-sex marriages also these days in many parts of the world. That's a different concept altogether. But when you ask a question like this, again, you are segregating. Try to get questions which are unifying rather than segregating. Not two versions of uh, opinions because of their gender, but two versions of opinions from single gender also, which might be similar to the other. So if you work a little more, I'm sure you'll come across wonderful areas where you are you know, overcoming this transcending this gender barrier and making them think like individual human beings, not male human being, female human being, but individual human being. Today, if you look at Google, you will find that there are 50, 60 genders. Gender is no longer man and woman. There are mm -hmm. varieties of genders. Therefore, we, um, you know, we have to be very careful when we are uh, training this generation because a lot of changes have taken place now and this is more you know this is a very important concept which since you have raised it we are talking about it that even language is supposed to be uh, you know gender neutral our behavior is supposed to be gender neutral these things are very important today so therefore think of about these things. I think uh, time is getting over. Everybody is worried about their uh, attendance uh, certificate, you know, obviously. So I uh, leave the session to the organizers. I haven't heard any of you, but maybe someday I will hear all of you. I thank, thank Mr. Biswas, Dr. Biswas. Very nice comment and very nice question. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, for patiently answering so many questions. Uh, it's a last query from my colleague, Mrs. Varlakshmi from Department of Science, ma'am. Please. Hello, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm uh, Varlakshmi from Statistics Department, St. Anne's College. I have a doubt, ma'am. Uh, so mm. just I was inspired with your line of saying that uh, we have to bring up our students from their comfort zone. Mm. So now these days, as we have to finish the syllabus, many of my colleagues also have said about this. So we uh, feel like giving them PDFs for uh, uh, solving their problems, maybe even for the uh, notes purpose. So, but uh, many of my students, I can see even not only my students, when I evaluate the papers also, even though they know the content, they are unable to present it properly. So as giving notes and dictating in the classroom is an old method. So like, how can we come out of that? Uh, like uh, your suggestion was like uh, bringing them from their comfort zone. Uh, at this point, as experienced your faculty, so what will be your suggestion? Kindly, I want to know this. See, one is that, you know, if you're finding that any one skill is 
undeveloped. Like you said, their presentation, their writing is undeveloped, which means we are not giving them enough um, you know, experience in this activity. When you dictate the notes, you do not know what they are writing down. So instead of dictating the notes, what you can do is you can make them write and you can make them read. Since time is short, already we know time is very short and we don't have much time with us. Therefore, five minutes of each class you go to them, make five students read out whatever they have written. In one minute, they can read about two to three hundred words. Two to three hundred words is wonderful. If they are capable of writing two to three hundred words, you know, 10 students are able to present per uh, class and you have a class of 60. So in one week's time, you're getting everybody to present one one minute of their presentation. 10 minutes of your class is cut short, but that 10 minutes is useful for them. So in a class, in a uh, semester of 75 classes, they have at least got five or six opportunities to read out. I'm sure you can guess this, that, you know, there are, um, they have got a chance. Their confidence level has built up. They have written and you have heard what they have written. You can immediately suggest changes. For a single individual teacher to read 60 pages and correct them every week and give back is not possible. It's not humanly possible. Therefore, you have to devise methods which is giving them practice in the skills which they don't have. You know, comfort zone are skills which they have. Like if you ask me to walk on the road, I can walk very well. I can cross any road and, you know, in Hyderabad, busy traffic, I can go. If you ask me to drive a scooter or a car, I don't have the confidence to do it. So I can walk, I can reach from place to place, but I'm not able to drive from place to place which means I don't have that skill. Our students are also like that. They have certain skills. They don't have certain skills. Since you have identified, you know, as a good teacher, you have identified that even if we give them notes, they are not able to reproduce. So stop giving at, at giving notes. Don't give notes. You say that, you know, look at this, this, this source. Write your own note, read it in the class and then tell me, whether you know you have understood what you have written they might copy from four sources they might write in first one or two presentations you will find that from the third fourth presentation they are eager to not write and say first when you ask them to do this they will all be hesitant they will not come forward at all because their comfort zone is the chair in the college my first question is, did they pay the fees to hire a chair in the college? Don't they have chairs at home on which they can sit? They need not come to college to sit on a chair. They have come to college for another purpose. And that purpose is very important. Therefore, we have to constantly make them do what they are unwilling to do, but which is good for them. You know, they don't know it is good for them. Therefore, they are unwilling to do it. But no. if they do it, then it would be beneficial for them. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this wonderful session. Thank you for letting us know teachers should be creative, a role model, understand the mindset of the child and awareness levels of them. Give them holistic development. I also thank you for this en uh, enlightenment to make us aware to get a transition from teacher-centric classrooms to other types of learning environment. Thank you very much for helping us all in growing as a better teacher by adopting some strategies for structuring the teaching learning ecosystem. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this enriching session. Thanks a lot. Now, we have a short presentation 
as glimpses of what has happened from day one to day six of this national level online faculty enhancement program on new age learning and teaching skills. you all got a roller coaster experience hope you all got a roller coaster experience of our faculty enhancement program
I'm really sorry for a small technical glitch which has happened. Now we can continue the session. Now, may I request Mrs. Antonia Ma, a lecturer, Department of Management, little, from Little Far Degree College, Hyderabad, to share her experiences on the six-day faculty and man enhancement program. Over to you, ma'am. For one minute duration, ma'am. Are you there, ma'am? Mrs. Antonia Ma, lecturer, Department of Management from Little Flower Degree College, Hyderabad. May I request? Sorry, ma'am. Mrs. Antonio. Can you all hear me? Yes, Sorry, ma ma yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Can you just share your experiences of this definitely, definitely. FAP of ours in a short minute, a minute duration? Definitely, ma'am. Thank yeah, you so ma much, ma'am, for giving me the opportunity of sharing my views. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate the team and management of St. Anne's Degree College for Women and uh, a PG College for Women for conducting and organizing this national level online faculty enhancement program on new age learning and teaching uh, skills. Ma'am, uh, as teachers, we are all practicing our old method of uh, methodology of teaching. One thing from last six days of sessions, one thing which I have learned is that we have to move from teacher centric to learning centric. What ma'am has said today, Sumita ma'am has said. And I think whatever we have learned, we have to put it in practice. And it is our responsibility to ensure that our students create their own identity. We all know that students learn subjects only from examination point of view. Instead of making them learn subjects only to pass that exam, we have to ensure that they should learn conceptual learning. On day one and day two, uh, we have learned about business analytics. I would like to thank Suvarchala ma'am to giving us insight on the importance of business analytics, bringing us close to data structure, helping us know how to use Excel solver tools. And last four days, uh, the resource persons have given us insight on various uh, teachers dimensions, uh, experiential learning, and then brainstorming. There are so many other techniques which we can adopt in our teaching now. And I'm sure everybody who have participated in this program have learned so many things, but the only thing is we have to remember and put it in practice. And I'm sure everybody will try and uh, implement it on a daily basis. Then only we can uh, ensure that whatever we have learned, it would be fruitful. And on behalf of Little Flower Degree College, Department of Management, I would like to thank all our resource persons and coordinator for conducting such a wonderful session and looking forward for more such sessions in future. And special thanks for Sister Emmy, Principal of St. Anne's uh, Degree and PG College and other coordinators for bringing us together national wide and helping us thank you so much ma'am that uh, really drives us and motivates us to do such kind of FEPs FEP still more thank you so much may I now invite miss yashoda an associate professor and head department of english from etiraj college for women chennai tamil nadu to give some glimpses on these six days of FAP. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity. I thank and congratulate 
St. Anne's degree and PG degree college for women on organizing the six-day national online faculty enhancement program on the theme, New Age Learning and Teaching Skills for the Teaching Fraternity of the Higher Education Institutions. The FEP, with its six sessions centering on business analytics, teachers' dimension for the first holistic development of students, pedagogical innovation, teaching Gen Z, has offered rich takeaways for us participants and has enhanced our knowledge and skills to facilitate academic, cognitive, social, emotional, and psychological development of the 21st century learners. As a participant, I found that the FEP has been meticulously organized in every term from the relevance of the theme, the resources, diligently planned sessions, to the sound technical arrangements. Arti, congratulations to the dedicated organizers. Thank you, everyone, once again. Thank you so much, ma'am. May I now request Mr. Manav Jyoti Biswas from Department of English, St. Anne's College, Kok Rajhar, Assam, to say a few words on our six day FEP. Over to you, sir. Thank you, ma'am, for giving me this opportunity to <coughs> share a few lines. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Manav Jyoti Biswas. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at St. Anne's College, Kok Rajhar, Assam. Uh, first, I would like to thank Sentence Degree College for Women and Sentence PG College for Women for organizing um, such an informative uh, faculty enhancement program. Special thanks to Sister Amy Vaz for giving us the opportunity to attend this online program for the past six days. Almost uh, 15 faculty members have joined from our college. Uh, I would also like to thank the research persons for their lectures on the topics that were assigned. All the topics were the need of the hour and they have enlightened us with their lucid presentations and made us uh, rethink our teaching pedagogy. It is uh, indeed very important for us teachers and faculty members to constantly uh, upgrade and improve our way of teaching. We cannot just keep the same style of teaching in these current times when everything is changing so rapidly, we need to learn, uh, upgrade, relearn the skills that are necessary. Otherwise, our students will be the one that suffers. So I appreciate the idea behind this webinar and would like to thank all the members that have made this webinar session successful. The question and answer sessions were also immensely helpful to clarify the doubts. Since uh, some of the topics were very new to me, I have gained new knowledge from the lectures on those topics. And it was overall very, uh, uh, very good for me, a very gainful experience for me. Thank you. Uh, God bless you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. May I now request Ms. Shivalakshmi, an associate professor of Defa Department of Computer Science, Avinash Degree College, Hyderabad, to say a few words on our national enhancement, faculty enhancement program. Ma'am, are you there? Shivalakshmi, ma'am. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. This is Shivalakshmi from Aminash Degree College, Kukar Pali. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, I'd like to thank Lavanya, ma'am, for giving me an opportunity to share, to share this experience. And on behalf of all the participants, I'd like to thank Sentence College Malapur for organizing a six-day FDP program. And in these six days, we have learned many things about uh, business analytics and the predictive analytics uh, and the way, different ways for uh, analyzing the data and the different tools which we can use for analyzing the data as well. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. K. Suvachala Rani, ma'am and Dr. Sarah Thomas and Mrs. Nidhi and also Professor Ruma Roy and uh, today's session Sumita Roy. They have taken the sessions very enthusiastically and we have learned uh, many things regarding the various teaching methodologies and uh, how to implement various teaching methodologies in our day-to-day -day teachings as well. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Happy to hear from you. Uh, lastly, may I request my colleague, Mrs. B. Shilpa, lecturer 
from Department of Commerce from St. Anne's Degree and PG College for Women Malapur to say a few words on our six-day FEP program. Over to you, Shilpa Ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. Teaching is a profession that teaches all other professions. Today, with this faculty enhancement program, I, Shilpa B, from Department of Commerce, St. Anne's Degree College, Malapur, learned many contemporary teaching techniques. Every time when I go to class to teach a particular topic, I used to think about how can I give my best. In these six days, I learned many teaching techniques from which I would like to share few. Insights given on business analytics was informative. Teacher dimensions for 21st century where emphasis was given on concept-based learning, gamification of learning, and problem-based learning. Holistic development in transformation to human consciousness was amendable. We even learned certain new topics like eco-pedagogy and entrepreneurial pedagogy which we heard for the first time. And from this today's session, I got inspired with one line saying that bringing out students from their comfort zone. We are looking forward to have many more sessions in future endeavors, balancing both theory and practical. My heartfelt thanks to the sentence college and the principal sister, Amy Gracivas and the organizers. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now, I request Professor Y. Sucherita, Chief Coordinator and Head, Department of Business Management, to deliver her concluding remarks on this FEP. Over to you, ma'am. A very good afternoon to our correspondent, Sister Shamla, our principal, Sister Amy Gracie Vaz, our eminent Lord. resource person of the day, Dr. Sumita Roy, and all the learned participants. We have come to the end of the six-day faculty enhancement program on new age learning and teaching skills. I'm sure all of you would agree with me that this FEP has helped us to realize that the new age teacher has tremendous responsibility as it is becoming more and more challenging to educate the young minds of the 21st century. And the, F and the FEP has given us valuable inputs for meeting this challenge. On day one and day two, Dr. Suvarshila Rani spoke a gave us a brief insights on business analytics, which is a very much an emerging area of study these days. On day three, we had Dr. Sarah Thomas, who helped us to realize the challenges of the 21st century classrooms and how we can handle the same. On day four, Mrs. Nidhi Chirag focused on how as individuals, we give more importance to physical needs and forget to work on our relationship with others. And we fail to understand our own selves. And as a teacher, we have to understand that and help our students to move from fulfilling their material needs to developing human consciousness and good human conduct. On day five, we had Professor Ruma Roy, who took us through the various pedagogical innovations in higher education. She helped us to realize that even if we are able to implement a few of these innovative practices, we would be able to overcome the challenges faced by the 21st century teacher. Today, day six, Professor Sumita Roy rightly said that today's teacher has to be a multifaceted personality. Teachers have to be creative 
and she dwelt on what are the requisites of today's teacher and gave us valuable strategies for enhancing the teaching learning environment so this journey of six days has been an enrich an enriching experience for all of us we have got very good feedback from our participants in fact few of my colleagues have even started implementing what they have learned in their classrooms as the chief coordinator the experience of organizing and coordinating this fep has been a fulfilling one i take this opportunity to thank god for his for his benevolence our correspondent sister shamla my principal reverend sister emi gracie vas who has motivated us always to explore and realize our potential the heads of various departments mrs saujanya mrs sunita and mrs hemalata who have given valuable inputs to structuring this program i would specially like to thank my colleague dr lavanya who has been highly resourceful and took up equal responsibility from day 1 for the smooth conduct of this program kudos to the technical team of mrs ashwini mr srinivas and mrs pallavi all six days without any technical glitches thanks to all the session coordinators and the team of mrs varlakshmi ms karuna and ms kiranmai for the dispatch of certificates session certificates have been sent to the participants those participants who have attended all the six days will get the faculty development certificate today we will be enabling the whatsapp groups for your valuable feedback and any queries regarding the certificates can be posted on the whatsapp group you can send us your valuable feedback and suggestions too and you could also mail us on fep2023 at saintansmalapur.com a heartfelt thanks to all the enthusiastic participants who joined us from different parts of the country thank you very much and mrs saujanya will now take over the session a small announcement uh, dear participants feedback link for today's session is posted in the chat box we request all of you to submit the form immediately as the link will be active only for the next 10 minutes thank you sucharita ma'am proceeding further ma'am has covered all uh, i'm rendering the thankfulness to all so i would like to cut short my vote of thanks once a great man whispered feeling thankfulness and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it today i take this opportunity to put all my gratitude into words firstly on behalf of entire fraternity of the institute i would like to thank almighty god for leading us and being with us in all the six days for this national level online faculty enhancement program titled new age learning and teaching skills and making it a resounding success i take immense pleasure in extending my sincere thanks to our research person for the day professor sumida roy thank you so much ma'am for accepting our invite and conducting such an enriching session truly said ma'am the success of student is an actual reward for the teacher thank you for sharing with us your words of wisdom thank you ma'am success of any event depends upon the participation number happy to inform you all that the participants belonging to various states of our country like assam uttar pradesh maharashtra tamil nadu karnataka andhra pradesh and telangana have attended truly appreciate 
their enthusiasm and commitment towards learning. Thank you, dear participants. My sincere gratitude to our correspondent, Reverend Sister Shamila, our dear principal and chief patron of the national online FEP, Sister Amy Grazy Vaz, for their constant support and enormous cooperation for the event. I extend my default thanks to the chief coordinator of the FEP, Professor Y. Sucharita, for making all feel welcome to the national online FEP with her meticulous planning and guidance. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to thank all the heads of the department with whose fine cooperation this event has become real. My sincere thanks to all the session coordinators, Dr. Lavanya, Mrs. Vimla Devi, Ms. Sunita, Mrs. Varalakshmi, Mrs. Ashwini, and today it's me. I would like to express my profound thanks to CTR cell members. Behind every success we attain lies a manifold work of our committed faculty. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very motivated and dedicated colleagues of St. Anne's who know their job and are all result oriented. I cannot thank everyone enough for their involvement and their willingness to take on the completion of tasks beyond their comfort zones. My sincere thanks to the technical support, Mrs. Vimla, Mr. Srinivas, Mrs. Ashwini, and Mrs. Pallavi for making us always to be connected with the Google Meet and the YouTube live stream in this virtual arena. Not to forget the registration and certification generation team, Mrs. Varlakshmi, Ms. Karuna, Ms. Kiran Mai for being prompt in carefully taking registrations, every day's feedback, and certificate generations. Last but not least, my heartfelt thanks to all the teaching and non-teaching fraternity of the college. Without you all, we will never have courage to dream and passion to make it happen. Thank you, one and all. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you. 